something that I felt should be shared this morning um, in terms of a topical, a topical message. And just to say, as the Sunday school kids are going out, Mago Sunday School, it's Katsako Gutige Uye Uye Ngale Bazo Kfundisa Izulimkos Hamba Hamba Vangili Hamba Oh Hamba Vangili Oh Hamba Vangili Ugo Hamba Hallelujah. People are in a traditional mood these days. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a sad time as we're learning of people passing away. It's quite, uh, well, people pass away every week. I guess it's people we know, celebrities and all of those. Uh, so we really need to, if you're a Christian, because we live in difficult times. It's not that sometimes people feel like, no, people are passing away more than other times. No, mm-hmm. people are passing away. It's just that um, maybe it's people that we did not know before, but now it's people that we know. Just want to encourage us, Bazalani, this Saturday, as we said, this is Okala Nye Transmission, um, is Okala half past eight, from half past eight to 11 o'clock. Mkala go to season, we're going to learn about the Word of God. So, Tola Mama Nyuali, Avanta Basiri Asige Nizule Nkosi. Uh, Bible, you will understand this, this Bible. We don't want to just be people like that just come on Sunday that go, but we don't know how to apply Linfula Mudimo. Amen. We need to apply this word. We want to live it. And, and what Ray was saying is powerful this morning. That's what we're about. We are about you through the spirit, through the word, changing. Uh, we're not about one person being exalted. We want you to learn this Bible by yourself. Amen. You being changed yourself. That is our joy. That's what brings us joy. To know what John says says to know that my says uh, to know that you are growing, that you are that the word of God is affecting your mind. John says this brings me joy. Amen. Amen. Um, and also just to also say about the Easter conference, uh, we're going to be holding it here uh, with Pastor Bafana. Um, uh, Pastor Caravo is coming through. Pastor Sanguin and all of those uh, brothers will be here. Please invite others who do not know about the Lord Jesus Christ. We want other people to know this thing that you are excited about. And so, um, yeah, uh, I'm hoping to see many of you as we plan for that uh, as they come to worship here with us. Those of you, how, how many of you have been to previous Easter conferences? Amen. Amen. You've been blessed by them. Amen. Yeah, it's a time where we're getting the word and we're really grow. Um, I think we might have a challenge with the kids, with the noise, but we'll, we'll try to continue. Um, what's the one th- other thing that I wanted to say? Uh, maybe it might come back to me to me later. But but this morning, Bazalane, Nfunukulmang is a subject, a subject that's very close to my heart, um, uh, that something that, 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 that we did, but wanted just for the, for the benefit of the church, for us to really um, have this subject in mind. Uh, this story appeared 2nd of January, 2021. Um, um, an advocate for responsible fatherhood, Robert Twane, is planning a 600-kilometer walk from Soshanguve to Tohoyando in Venda on the 2nd of January 2021. A walk, not drive, from Soshanguve to Tohoyando. This was an article 
and I saw it on the news. That's why it grabbed my attention. Tony wants to use the walk to encourage fathers to take responsibility for their children, raise awareness on gender-based violence as well as child-headed households. This is the quote. Yeah, uh, I'm taking the back routes so that I can talk to people. I'm not going to walk on the N1 because that will be a straight walk to Toyandu. By taking the back routes, it will be an opportunity for me to get to community radio stations, get to NGOs along the way, speak to fathers and all that, just to get a feel with regards to what they think because it's a scourge. Renali pandemic, what they call a pandemic. According to this father, we have another pandemic. The fact that fathers are not taking care of their kids is a scourge. And it's creating a huge problem. And speak to women as well, just to get the feelings on how this is affecting them. This is from the SABC News. I want to speak about fatherlessness and the family. The family and fatherlessness. This is a, this is a one-time topic before we get into our series on the book of First John. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are our Father, you are our King. Now speak to us, Lord, from your word, that we may see the seriousness of this and we may take up our role as men, as fathers in our communities, so that we can change our communities. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, the one thing that I forgot to say was on Saturday, Barcelona, we have, we have about 50 kids that come here. It has grown, started from three to five. Now it's about 50 kids. Literally, there's no space here that come to be trained or to be helped with tutoring school um, from all around the schools. And um, yeah, it, it's very overwhelming. And I was here even yesterday and, you know, my wife is, there's all kinds of people you can imagine, there's great level and great what what. All of them need help. So they have even asked for help outside. But I thought it would be so nice to have the people from our community come and help us. Because many times we complain about things that are not right, but we're not part of the solution so that they can make it. How, how awesome would it be to have some of these kids, you know, when they talk about their story of life, to say that, you know, this is the place where they were influenced, that you and me played a part in their, in their life. And so it gets very overwhelming. We had to, Jeff and myself were busy there, Slung Sisinkwa, just for them to have something to eat. And there's other kids, they're trying to study, they need, or we, we need help. Uh, even if you are not a tutor, but just to come and, and, and just be there on Saturdays is from, I think it's one, is it one, two, three? From 12 to 5. It's from 12 to 5. It started from 12 to 3. The kids said, no, we want more hours. That's how desperate the situation is. So it's from 12 to 5 p.m. They are here learning and catching up on, on schoolwork. So it would be nice if TCM can be involved with that. Um, yeah, so speak to my wife and uh, just find out how you can, how you can be part of this. Um, it's just the one thing that I wanted to say that was also on my mind. But back to this um, story, Saga Robert Tuane. I think it's, it's one thing to argue um, about whether this problem, your fatherlessness and the family is a problem. But if a guy takes a walk from a social movie to Toyandu, for 600 kilometers, just for awareness on this problem. It lets you know, Jorge, this thing is serious. At least for him, it's serious. It has to take tremendous amount of courage, but also frustration for a man to walk that far just to make people aware of the problem of fatherlessness. This issue has financial implications. This issue has social implications. 
This issue has psychological, it has emotional implications. It's not just a small issue that is affecting us. And, and I want us as a church to be aware of this because I'll say in the moment how we as Christians, how we as the church, how we as the men can actually, as we are sitting there, how we can play a role in changing this in our community. You were even seeing yesterday, those of you who are also aware of what's happening in our community, people are frustrated by government. People are frustrated by community leaders. People are frustrated by companies who are not willing to a community in some of our issues. There was a march from, from, from more east to, uh, to, to HM Pitch. I don't know if you are aware of that. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's, a, there's a hashtag, there's a movement called Bring Back HM Pitch, which is a, a hashtag of people that have gotten together to say, let's rebuild HM Pitch Stadium. Those of you who know the history of what HM Pitch used to be. But that movement is also encompassing a hospital that is not right. It's encompassing a lot of problems that we are having. Uh, people are seeing that our community leaders, our politicians are not able to help us. And so some of these things, they lie at the door of the church. Because we as the church is our role to step in and say, we have the answer. It's like I'm sitting in class and we lift up our hands. And say, hey. Like we have the answer. And that's what I want us to do this morning, especially on this issue. Because we don't want to keep quiet when such things are happening. Because we have to go back to the word of God because the manufacturer knows how he designed this thing. He knows how the parts are supposed to work. So this morning, I want to reflect on the topic of the family. The topic of the family under three headings. Three headings. Number one, the family is an institution established by God. The family is an institution established by God. Number two, the man has been placed by God to be the head of his family. Number two, the man has been placed by God to be the head of his family. Number three, parents are the primary disciples of their kids. Number three, I'm going to show this from the word of God. Firstly, it is an institution established by God. Let's turn to Genesis 2.24. Open your Bibles to Genesis 2.24. Because even as we are talking to people on the street, around, they've got a misunderstanding about the institution of the family. Um, it's important for us to reflect on this as Christians. And Uguti say respond, Uguti, okay, Israel and Kosi, Lischelan, what does it say about this issue we are facing? Number one, it's an institution established by God. What do I mean by that? I mean it's God's idea. That's what I mean. The family is God's idea. It's not our idea. We didn't come together and say, Let's come up with an institution called the family. Um, look at Genesis 2.24. It says this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Don't have another version? Or in speed. It's gone. All right, we'll continue. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 5, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So it's quoted in the Old Testament, but then Jesus repeats it again in the New Testament. When he was asked by the Pharisees, where the Pharisees asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning created them male and female. Then I quote the Genesis 2.24. Guru Jesus was affirming that institution as an institution of God. Mark 10.7 For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. Mark 10.8 And the two will become flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16 or don't you know that he who, who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her 
in body. For it is said, the two will become one flesh. Amen. So in all of these scriptures, we are, we are seeing that this verse is being affirmed. That the man shall leave his father and the two shall become one. Ephesians 5.31 For this reason, a man will leave his father and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Paul is quoting this, trying to prove how a man must love his wife and care for him just as Christ cared for the church. What does he use in order to prove this point home? He uses Genesis 2 verse 23 to 24 that the two must become one flesh. Hallelujah. So this is God's idea. This is not our idea. Because if we came up with this idea, we would have come up with great ideas that don't work. Hallelujah. We've got great ideas as humans. And the marriage institution has hit so much flag and so much uh, uh, challenges that people are now putting other ideas on the table. Like this one idea from uh, this couple, Baraki, Anne Marie, Kelly, and Joseph Eagle. They decided, Horebona, in their marriage, this thing of becoming one flesh, this thing of until death do us part, is not going to work for them. So what did they do? They said, we are going to have marriage, but we're going to have it in five-year terms. We're going to have a contract. Hore Altoma, both you and me sign a contract. Hore, after five years, if we are not happy, we review it again. So we sign a contract to say, you and me are going to have a relationship. Let's check it out after five years. If it doesn't work, then we need to review this contract again. These are some of the bright ideas that we have as humans in terms of marriage. So she says the first five years they were crazy in love. But after that, they had to decide if they want to marry again for the next five years. So every five years, Linali Barking and Imbizo, Linali Indava. He says, all right, he says, all right, okay, sharp. let's sign another contract. The end of our marriage, she says, we sit down about three months in advance, three months before the five years ends, and we say, okay, where have you been? Where do we want to go individually? Where do we want to go as a couple? Do we still want to be together? That's what they say. And then they decide if they continue. Now, the story of Anna Marie and, and Joseph Eagle is... Positive in a sense because they've been married six times for 31 years, meaning uh, six times five. <laughs> so after five years, they decided that they're going to continue marriage. But the idea that every five years you can reevaluate whether you still want to be married or not is man's idea. That's what Jesus was correcting when he said, What God, what God has joined together, let no man separate. That's what shocked the disciples, right? They were so amazed. They even said, if the relationship with the man is this way with his wife, it's better not to marry. That's how shocked they were because even in the Jewish system, it was easy for you to divorce your wife. You could divorce your wife for anything. If your wife looked you the wrong way, you could divorce her. <laughs> but Jesus, that's why he had to take the standard high and say, no, from the beginning, it was not that way. So the elephant in the room is God. The family is an institution that assumes the existence of God. The family is an institution that assumes the existence of God. So if you are a person who doesn't believe in God, but you are married, you are testifying that there's a God <laughs> without you knowing God is such a factor and a force to be reckoned with that whether you believe him or not, but if you are married, you will stay married till death do you part. Or not this thing where I must stay with this person till death do me part. Why? It's because this is an institution and boundaries established by God. See, our ideas about relationships and how to make them work are not working for us, Pazalot. They're not working for the world. They're trying everything, but they're not working. Will Smith and Jerry Smith have openly said that they have an open marriage. But last year I, I heard Will Smith admit that he was angry with his wife for what she had, what, she, what he called an entanglement. The wife said, I had an entanglement, her confessor on camera, telling to his husband, Will. And Will was angry, Hori. Everyone was talking about king into entanglement. What is an entanglement? What is an entanglement? 
But if you have an open marriage and you allow each other to date, what's the problem? It should be fine. If that's your system that you work, you shouldn't be angry that that's happening. God's idea of staying faithful to one partner for life is a stamp that he as our manufacturer has designed us as a way to live. No matter how smart your ideas will always fall short of God's idea. No matter how many ideas we try, even trying to normalize same-sex couples relationship, it will never work. So us as Christians, we need to reflect upon this, Fazalan. We must start with God, right? When we think about institution of the family, we must start with God. We must start with what did he mean when he established the institution of the family? And what we get from Genesis is that he established it not just as an institution, but there was a purpose to it. The purpose was that the, the two people must be fruitful and multiply. That's what he said in Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply. So that's why we start with God. God is real. God has plans of how he wants us to live. The family is part of God's greater plan to display his attributes to the world. So anytime you get married, you are fulfilling the dominion mandate with your partner. Amen. Because God said, let them be fruitful, let them multiply, let them dominate the earth. That's why you need another person to come as a helper to help you fulfill that dominion mandate. It's for companionship, praise the Lord. But the bigger purpose is for the two to dominate the earth. Number two, and, and this is where the story of Robert comes into play. Second reflection, the man has been placed by God to be the head of his family. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and his himself. Its savior. This is how God has established the order. The problem is not the order. The problem is the men have abandoned their role to be Christ-like leaders in their homes and society. Let me say that again. The problem is not the order. The problem is that we as men have abandoned our role to be Christ-like leaders in the home and in society. That's why we are suffering for it. It's so serious that even it affects the fabric of society. Our whole society is suffering for us moving away from God's order. Something as simple as deciding not to be a father to a child actually affects the progress of a society. There's a guy called Freaks from Northwest University. He continues to say that South Africa has the highest figures of father absence. Listen to this. These are statistics. This is the reality of where we live. 63% of suicides come from fatherless homes. Suicides, abantabas bulalai, when you kill yourself. 63% of them, according to statistics, not people who's thinking, reality, when they check how many people, those who kill themselves, 63% of those people come from fatherless homes. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. When they check the statistics, they come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists motivated by displaced, displaced anger come from fatherless homes. 40% of all children do not live with their biological fathers. 85% of children with behavioral problems come from fatherless homes. This is not something we're making up. This is the reality of where we live. 90% of homeless children come from fatherless homes. Men commit 90% of major crimes. Men commit 100% of rapes. 
Men commit 95% of burglaries. Men commit 91% of offenses against the family. Men comprise 94% of drunk drivers. So a major part of the imbalance of the family is the absence of the father. Maybe you're not uh, a stats person. Well, one of my favorite actors, Denzel Washington, says this about the importance of the father in the home. He was interviewed, wanted to play his interview, but he was interviewed. And then they asked him about the state of what's happening to men in the society and what this justice system is doing about it. And the, the interviewer wanted him to comment on what is happening, why is the justice system, why is it failing our, our men? This is what he said. He asked, do you think we've made a headway in the justice system? Denzel replied, I think it's important to make headway in our own house. Then he says, by the time the system comes, the damage has already been done. Then he told the story of a young man who was killed by another teenager and asked the question we should be asking more in the media. Denzel asked the question not about crying about the young man. He said, where was his father? The man who was killed says, where was his father? Somebody says the father was not there. Where was his father? Right? This is how God has established the order. There's a link between what happens in the home and what happens in society. There's a link between what happens in the home and what happens in society. Where I live or where we live or where I used to live, and all the places in South Africa, majority of time, our kids are growing up with parents without a father. When, this, when politicians discuss problems in our society, you don't hear them talking about fatherlessness. One of the first things we should have done after 1994, when we got our freedom, we should have focused on this issue of what the apartheid system did. We don't hear about it in the media. We don't hear about it as politicians. Our society has so given up on the problem that I think we're now focusing more on women than we are men, right? That's how much we've given up on the problem. Again, as Jesus said about divorce, it was not meant to be this way. I want you to know that. It was not meant to be this way. It's the same thing with men being leaders in our homes. God meant that men were to be the carriers and passers of information to their families. That is how he planned society. That's why in Genesis 2.15, the man was the first one to receive information. Right? The man was the first one to receive information about the mandate of what they were supposed to do. But the man, unfortunately... He didn't carry out that information properly because when you see what Eve is saying, Eve doesn't give the exact information of what was communicated. Then you get to see which probably the man also played a role in that. You get to see and appreciate that men were supposed to pass information to their generations. It says in Judges 2 verse 6, When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to its inheritance, took their possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who had lived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord has done. In the Old Testament, every time you had leaders, every time you had men in their place, the people continued to serve the Lord. But every time those men went away, society went its own way. Number three. The parents are the primary disciples of their kids. The parent is supposed to be the one who disciples their kids. I've got so many scriptures that I wanted to read here, but we'll, because of time, I'll just go through them. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. It talks about the parents and the grandparents being the one. Deuteronomy verse 6, verse 4 to 9, it's the parents that are supposed to teach their kids. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. Maybe we'll check, we'll check that on what? Can you just check Ephesians? Let's just check one scripture. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. 
Ephesians 6 verse 4. Can we all read it together? What does it say? Let's start from verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on this earth. Verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Who are, who's instructed here? It's fathers, right? Who are instructed? Look at chapter, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8. Psalms, Proverbs. Proverbs 1 verse 8. Are you there? Let's read it together. Proverbs 1 verse 8. Hear, my son, my fa your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Who are the two people that are supposed to teach the children here? It's mother and father, right? Once you're in Proverbs, flip a few pages forward. Proverbs 3 verse 5. Proverbs, sorry, sorry 4 verse, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 3 to 5. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 3. Let's read together. When I was a son to my father, tender and only a son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments alive. Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Last one, Proverbs 6, chapter 6, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. Let's read together. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Right? I mean, there's Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11. There's Psalm 78, verses 1 to 8 that gives the responsibility of parents and also congregation. Here's what you find, all of scripture. 99% of the time, it's parents who are supposed to be discipling the kids. 99% of the time, mother and father are the ones who are supposed to teach their children. It's not supposed to be other people outside. 1% of the time, it's the congregation, it's the church. This is uh, some of the statistics of um, how people came to Christ. People were asked, at what age did practicing Christians come to Christ? Right? 40% of people came to Christ between the age, under the age of five. 40% of people, Bazu Jesu, before the, under the age of five. 16% between the ages of 5 to 10. 19% 11 to 18. 8% 19 to 24. 9% they, they don't know. 8% 25 in their age. What does it tell you? The parents play a major role in people having to come to know Jesus. The later it becomes, obviously God is sovereign, God can change people. But we're just looking at the statistics of when we look at people, it's very clear that when people are older, they, they're less likely to receive Christ than when they are younger. Mm -hmm. So the parents play a role. Doesn't mean that they can't be saved. God can save anyone. Amen. Mm -hmm. God can change anyone. But as we look at it from a societal point of view, and we're just looking, we see that the parents play a role in children coming to faith, in them teaching them about the word, in them praying with them before they sleep, in reading a bedtime story. Amen. It's the role of the parents. And then another question was asked, what were the key factors in you coming to faith? Uh, children between 11 and of eight and to 18 years old. This was the answer. 17% of people said it's because of Sunday school. 17% of people were influenced by Sunday school. 21% it was reading their Bible. 
21% of people that became Christians said it's because of reading their Bible. 41% said it's growing up in a Christian family. More people said we came to know God in our family because of how we saw our mother, because of how we saw our father. That influenced us to know God. It's not that thing, the importance of Bible reading in the church. Very important. In fact, because here we, with the situation that we find ourselves, we find ourselves as the church having to do sometimes the work of parents, right? Because sometimes of what happens. Sometimes someone doesn't have a father, doesn't have that. And so the church plays that role. And that's why I was encouraging everyone in the church to say, we need to come and then Amen. 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 Because we find ourselves in a difficult situation. If Tina, we neglect that opportunity or that, that responsibility, we're going to have kids that grow up without a rooted, being rooted in God, without being rooted in what is right and wrong. As the church, that's why we say we are community serving is one of our values. We are here as well to make sure that we, we teach Christ and we teach the word of God. To people in the community. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we do this? It's easy to talk about the statistics. We see what the Word of God says, but then, how do we do this? One of my favorite heroes is a man by the name of John Piper, and he was asked a question. Now that he's older, he was saying, "What would you have done differently?" If you are to do raising your kids again, what would you have done differently? And this is what he says. And this is for those who are parents, those who have kids. He said, what I would have done differently is that I wouldn't have just provided for them. Just a home. Make sure that they, all of that is taken care of. He says, what I would have done differently, he said, I would have pursued their heart. I would have asked hard questions. I would have asked why questions. In other words, I wish I had the time so that Nkulumenabo and find out what's happening in their heart. What's happening in them. And not because sometimes as parents we think we've given you the best, right? You've got a home, you've got all that you need. Therefore, you should be fine, you should go ahead. But we should go deeper than that and actually get to know and understand our kids. Right? And this is, this is what we see about Jesus, right? This is what we see about Jesus. Jesus didn't just come and say, here I am, God. You said I must come. Hey, same figure, can I go back? Shut He didn't just come, just arrive, and then fulfill the minimum requirements, and then go. But, but Jesus loved us, right? He fulfilled our deepest needs. He didn't just show up on earth. But according to John 17, he connected us to God. He gave us eternal life. Mm -hmm. Right? Through his spirit, he keeps pursuing us, even in spite of our sin. All right? I find that as much as I'm there physically as a father, but emotionally, I can be absent as well. So it's important for us to be emotionally present. My, my wife and my kids need my emotional presence. Right? So that's what I would encourage to those who are fathers. Be there emotionally for your family. It's not just good enough just to say, I've given them a home, I've given them water, you know, you're staying under my roof, but we have to pursue them emotionally. Gospel calls us to pursue our spouses and children. We're not just called to fulfill the minimum requirements. But secondly, I think the church plays a role. The church, we play a role in this because of our community, and where we find ourselves. That's why I'm calling on all those who are part of our church to say, guys, I, I pray that your vision of life is bigger than just the typical vision of saying, I want to study, I want to finish, I want to get money, I want to leave this place so I can stay in Santin so that I can be away from the community. I, 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 I call upon you, I plead with you to have a vision bigger than that. Who's going to raise these kids on Kemasambe? Right? Who's going to raise them? Who's going to influence them if everyone's dream is to leave the township and go to the suburbs? Nothing wrong with that. It's fine. But I'm just appealing to you. When Paul says, I appeal to you as a father to say, 
Look at the situation we have. You can play a role. Like you can play a role. I know it's boring. It's boring. It takes up time. I know you guys are busy. But you just have to make time. Because it takes us coming and showing that kid how to do a, a mess problem. It takes us coming, being there for our children when people are trying to abuse them. Like we cannot shut off. We cannot shut down. We have to be connected to what's happening to our kids. Otherwise, we're going to lose this generation. So I, I'm just appealing to us, Bazalane, to say, let us be present. Let us, let us care for what's happening around us because it's a concern of mine. I just see there's, there's people at our house that are always there just outside. They're just standing there. They're not doing anything. And we try to talk to them. And I don't know. There's something that we are missing with the generation. I'm not sure what we're doing wrong. But I know that we have to go back to the word. I know that God is true. I know that they need the gospel. Amen. Amen. I know that the gospel is going to help them. People like Robert Twan that I started with as I conclude. And the normal fathers who wake up, help out their kids, prepare their breakfast, take them to school, wrestle with their kids, they will not be thought of as radical in our society. Nobody's going to put a post of them and say, this is your celebrity. Nobody's going to think of them. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes for society to change. Slow, boring, consistent actions that will yield fruit in years to come. And even those who are not yet married, how do you contribute to this? Do it God's way. Do it God's way. Do not sleep with somebody who's not your husband or your wife. Do not sleep with somebody who's not your husband or your wife. That's not God's design. God designed that you get married, you have a husband, you have a wife and then you have kids. That's the structure of the family. That's how God has designed it to be. And so when we do this, it's not just you disobeying God, but what you don't realize, you are contributing another statistic to the community that we have. We're becoming another statistic. So for us as the church, we need to be different. We cannot do what the world is doing. Right? The world is going to change. Mami Lord is going to change. Mahube is going to change. If you and me act like Christians. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to do this amazing thing. Just be a Christian. Just do the slow, boring things. That's what it takes. In years to come, that's what's going to yield fruit. Sometimes we think that we must, I don't know, be this amazing person. No. Just give up your time. Just love people. Right? And in years to come, we're going to see a difference. And for those I know who have coming from broken homes, I know that, unfortunately, this is where we find ourselves. I want you to know that that's why we're singing about God as a father, right? God is our father. Amen. God is the one that can take care of you. The church is also here. That's why we have men and women here. Men who will protect you. Men who will be there for you. Even if you might not have a father at home. You do have brothers. You do have other men that are here that are saying, we will take up that role as much as we can. Where that one failed, we will come in. Amen. And we commit ourselves as the church to be a light in this community. We're not just going to be a church where everyone just comes on Sundays and leaves. We're going to make an impact in this community where young people are going to come to faith in God. Young people are going to see their lives change. Young people are going to become something in life. Amen. That's what we want to be um, as a church. So, I was, I was really wanting to start the new series, but it's just something that's been on my heart that I really wanted to share us from the Word of God that we need to think seriously, especially for those who are men, those who are fathers, those who are singing. Think seriously about the role that you play in the community. It's not just you, your individual salvation, but you are contributing something to the community. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you that you are our Father. Uh, when you didn't leave, you stayed. Thank you, Lord, for staying. Um, staying long enough until you died, actually. You finished the, 
the cause, Lord. You didn't leave us halfway. I just want to pray for those who are, might be hurt or bruised by their fathers in whatever way, Lord. I just pray for them, Lord, that you may restore them Murima, in a way that only you can do it. We, we recognize the need for a father, Lord. We recognize the need to have uh, somebody who, who just protects us, somebody who loves us. We have that need. And I pray that you will feel that need for anyone who longs for that presence. And I pray that we as the church, as TCF, may step into that role and may actually be what uh, be those fathers that other people never had. We pray that our community, Lord, these young men, oh Father, that are just uh, roaming around and not having, oh God, a connection. I pray that you will transform this community, that we can have young men that take their role seriously, young men that think about Oh God, they are rolling society. Young men that are, are thinking about the future of the township, the future of the black race, the future of, oh God, people or who are like us. Oh God, I pray that you, you, you place this upon them, that they are the future. They are the next generation. May you cause a revival to happen amongst young people, oh God, that we may see young men taking responsibility, taking to loving their kids, loving their wives, staying married, oh God, staying faithful, staying pure, oh God. That we may be a people that are truly different, as you have said in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.